Tonight's episode doesn't come with a spoiler warning. It comes with a don't go there unless you have hours to burn warning. Because we're going to be talking TV tropes. And welcome back to the heart of the stories we tell. I'm Rob the Host, and this is another look deep into what makes a story a story. A theory on storytelling by a storyteller who believes that every story has merit. And tonight's episode is... Tropes, or very specifically, TV tropes. For those of you not in the know, those are the examples of things that people use all the time, like a shorthand for how stories work. For instance, you know, the red shirt theory. That's a trope. It's a very specific trope to Star Trek, but then people started using it for other things too and started saying, that's the red shirt of this. The website itself, tvtropes.com, has thousands of these, and people post all sorts of things, but once you start reading them, you go down the rabbit hole. And like that cartoon showed at the beginning, I've spent many nights, sleepless nights, reading through, and just one more page, one more page. Tonight I'm going to walk you through some of the ones that I think are the most important for what I talk about. And the first thing I'm going to talk about is a Disney cartoon of all things. Because this is David Zonatos, and he's the first time I remember re watching a cartoon and thinking, Hey, wait a minute, did the villain just win? This scene right here is from the end of an episode. The whole episode, the main hero of the story had been fighting and beating back Zonatos' forces, and no one could figure out what Zonatos really wanted. But he just kept coming, and they stopped him, and they stopped him flat, with the help of the woman here, a fox, when she turned on him and gave state's evidence. And then, boom, the end of the episode is this, and him going, I didn't care about any of that. I just wanted a way to get you free. I just wanted a way to get the woman I loved back. And that set up something that happened throughout the entire series over and over again. No matter what you did, Xanatos always had a way of winning. And the first TV trope I remember really looking up is something they called a Xanatos Gambit because he's far from the only villain that's ever pulled it off. In fact, there are some heroes that do. People claim Batman pulls Xanatos gambits all the time. And what is it? That's when no matter what you do, I come out on top. My plan has a bunch of contingencies. I either get this, that, or this other thing. No matter what, I always win. And it's a great way to stop what I think is one of the worst things, but we'll get to that one in a minute. First, let's talk about Chekhov's gun. That one comes up a lot in TV shows. And the basic theory is, if you show something, it has to be useful. Now here's the real cheat. If you're reading a novel, there's lots of time to put in extra stuff. Oh yeah, and talk about what color the tree is, and talk about what type of mushrooms grow here. But in TV shows and movies, you don't have that type of time. If you put something on stage, you focus on it, it's important. And if it's important, it's going to be used. So Chekhov's gun says if you put a gun on the TV screen, that gun's going to be fired. I hope by now you're getting the idea of how these things work. And again, there's hundreds of them. I, couldn't, I could probably spend an entire year just going through page by page and going through examples of these. But let's move back to the guy who's always got a plan. Now, as much as the plan itself might be a Xanatos gambit, the person making the plan is normally a chess master. Now, I'm going to just say right off the bat that I have a problem with this. People like to use chess as this ultimate strategy guide. But I want you to think about this for a second. As much as strategy is involved in chess, I like the way Kirk answers better. Instead of playing chess, I play poker, because I know how to bluff. Either way, the idea of the chess master is just someone who can think long ways ahead and plan and outmaneuver his enemies. Alright, so those are pretty cool ones. But let's talk about one that isn't so cool, but I use from time to time. The Idiot Ball. The writer of Herman's Head used to say they used to give each character a chance at the Idiot Ball, because in order to make their stories work, they needed someone to act dumber than they need to. How many times have you seen that in a show? Hey, this person should know better than that. Yeah, well, they're carrying the Idiot Ball because it's needed for the plot to continue. That's a bad one. But it happens, and now you can even understand why it happens. Let's go back to the villains for a moment. What would you call it when there's a villain, someone who does lots of bad things, but you kind of respect them, they're kind of cool. They come off as badass, they have the cool powers, they always get the cool catchphrases. They're the character that just, you know, you kind of want to be, even though you don't want to be the villain, you want to be the hero, but... Well, they're a magnificent bastard. 
they're still a bastard, but they're pretty awesome about it. Some characters, especially in comic books, the villains get to get their own series and sometimes become heroes just because they need a way to make them accessible. But at the end of the day, they're all magnificent bastards. Have you heard any negative criticism about the Wonder Woman movie? Maybe you've heard of the Smurfette Principle then. The Smurfette Principle is a TV trope where you always include one female character. And you know what? It doesn't even have to just be a female character. You might have one black character, one Hispanic character, or for people that are trying to go for the whole thing, well, you know, we can have ten guys that are white guys, one Hispanic, one Asian, and one woman. Yeah, even the one that I said were pretty good with diversity later on started out with the Smurfette principle. Now, all in all, these are some of these are good, some of these are bad, but the ones that's the most likely is the one that I said that the Xanatos Gambit avoids. Villain Decay. Have you ever watched a TV show, read a book, seen a comic, even just be told a story where someone is a grade-A badass villain? The first time they show up, they beat the heroes up. There's almost no way to stop them. Second time they show up, well, yeah, okay, they're, they're a little bit easier now because we know their weakness. And then all of a sudden they just become more villains? Let, let's talk about the Borg for a minute. They show up in an episode entitled Q-Who, and the Enterprise has no chance against them. The only chance they have is to ask Q to send them away. And they do, and they get away from them. The next time they show up, they take Picard, the whole Starfleet has to fight them, and even still, they barely manage to pull off a victory. Oh yeah, by the time Voyager rolls around, they're just another villain. To be fair, by that point, they had already been beaten by the Enterprise three or four times, including one where Lore took control over a group that had been given their own independence and there was a secondary collective and, well, the Borg did show up like three or four times on Voyager. Star Trek is full of these and it's not just that. Have you ever heard of the Jem'Hadar? First time they show up, their ships can fire right through the shields of most Federation ships. They're super strong, they're super fast, they're almost unbeatable, and their sensors can see through cloaks. Next time they show up, well, they're badasses. Next time they show oh yeah, eventually they get to the point where they're being taken out wholesale. Why? Because once you've seen someone get beat over and over and over again, it's hard to see them as badass. And this problem happens to the writers, too. The villain decay just kind of sets in. And it's not just villains, either. Once you see someone get beat up over and over and over again, it's hard for them to regain their status as badass in your mind. Now, having said that, I want to move on to something that is going to play a big part in my next couple of videos. Maybe not next week, but I want to cover a series, and genre savvy is a big important part. Now, a lot of times genre savvy is played for laughs, but not always. The idea that someone understands the rules of their in-universe situation, the fact that they've read these types of comics before. But I want you to think for a minute just how unrealistic it is, and we're going to start with Scream. I loved this movie when it came out, and one of the first things that they said at the beginning of the movie made me sit there and go, huh, yeah, right. Oh no, there's this sound outside, that's when they get killed. Oh no, that's when the person runs up the stairs instead of running out the front door. But if you think about it, if you're home alone and you hear a noise outside, what is it you do? You laugh, you're not in a horror movie, of course you can check out what knocked over your garbage cans pretty safely unless you live in the worst of neighborhoods. And don't ever say I'll be right back. How many times a day do you say I'll be right back and don't think anything of it? The thing is, is that very specific tropes to the TV show, to the movie, to the novel, are things that just would be commonplace in real life. Now, yeah, there are certain things like, hey, there's an axe killer on the loose and it's all over the news. Okay, maybe you don't go out alone. That makes sense. But whether or not you've lost your V-card really isn't a safety mechanism unless you're in a horror movie. Scream took this idea and totally ran with it. And again, I, I still could rewatch this movie especially with some of the twists. But it wasn't really played for laughs as much as it could have been. 
The series I'm going to cover probably in two weeks, though, is one I've been talking about since one of my first videos. And it has a genre-savvy main character for years. I introduce you to the Order of the Stick and Elon. But, for now, I want to talk a little more about tropes in general. It's easy enough to write off tropes and cliches as bad, but they're good, too. There's a reason we like stories, we feel comfortable in stories, and sometimes that's knowing that the red shirt's the one that's gonna die, but sometimes it's the twist that comes when they're ignored, and the red shirt doesn't die. Spock goes in and saves the day and dies in the process. But at the same time, at no point do I think that anyone should be writing just tropes. And there are some writers out there that I feel do. Okay, this is what we call a paint-by-numbers series. This happens, then that happens, then this happens. Why? Because that's the way these stories always go. This cartoon is a perfect example. It used tropes when it wanted to, and it exploited them, but it also ignored them and went past them. And in doing so, it created, at least in my mind, the Xanatos Gambit. But that's my thought. And like I said, tropes are good and tropes are bad. What are your thoughts? Are there other tropes you'd like to see me cover in a part two of this in a month or so? Are there things that you think that I didn't say right about them? Let me know. And if you got caught in a big loop of, oh god, just one more page, let me know that too. In the meantime, if you're still here, hit that like button and share this video. And subscribe if you haven't already, because I'm trying to build a community here. One that can take a look at the good and the bad and everything in between as we explore what makes a story a story, and why we like some, and why we dislike some. All of that and more as we walk through the heart of the stories we tell. Have a good night and thanks for watching.